De frente, mar. Communism's castaway, marooned in the Cold War, Cuba is soldiering on alone, determined to defend its revolution. Cuba is keeping up its barriers, trying to hold back the tide of history. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? Darnos por vencido. Renunciar a la revolución. Renunciar al socialismo. Rendirnos. Lo que debemos hacer es resistir y luchar. On January the 2nd, 1959, the rebel army entered Havana. It was a revolution that captured the world's imagination, a romantic revolution. Fidel Castro and his military chief, Che Guevara, became the icons of the 60s generation. The eyes of the world were focused on this little island in the Caribbean Sea. Cuba became a source of inspiration for millions. But that image has changed. Miami, 1991. Only 90 miles away across the Florida Strait. This is where most of Castro's opposition lives. Over a million Cubans, a tenth of the island's population, have fled the revolution. Disillusioned with the growing repression of Fidel Castro's regime, they voted with their feet. After 32 years, the exiles are convinced that freedom is about to come to the Cuban people. I think that this year is going to be, again, a very, very important, decisive year. Uh, I don't see Castro remaining in power beyond 1992. A lot of people are defecting every day. That's a very clear sign of the internal breakdown of the morale of the, of the system. Viva Cuba Libre! Viva! Viva nuestro soldado! Viva! Here in Miami, most Cubans are convinced that Fidel Castro's fall is now imminent. His economy shattered, his regime isolated. Castro's revolution is facing its most serious challenge yet. But he remains defiant proclaiming socialism or death. So which one will it be? It was in the remote Sierra Maestra Mountains on the southern tip of Cuba that the revolution was born. Revolutionary zeal is still all pervasive here. Once neglected and impoverished, the village of Providencia now has food for all. Gervasio, the local bakery manager, was a willing recruit to Castro's cause. The excitement of the fighting in these hills remains fresh in his mind. I was 18 years I incorporated to take to subir ganado. Hacer mensaje, a trabajar personal, a trabajar prisionero. Con Fidel, con Fidel nosotros, bueno, llegamos a estar Fidel, llevamos el mensaje, le damos el mensaje, lo recibía, llevamos mercancía, él se ponía muy contento, muy orgulloso con nosotros. From small beginnings with only a dozen men in the mountains, Castro swiftly gained support in his campaign against brutal government troops. In less than two years, the guerrillas had swept across the entire island to victory. Fate has smiled on Providencia. Villages like this one have been the main beneficiaries of Castro's socialist policies. At 18, Javasio could neither read nor write. Now Cuba has one of the highest literacy rates in the world. After adult classes, Javasio too was able to join Cuba's army of bureaucrats. His wife is a pharmacist at the village chemist, but their real pride is how well their children have done under the revolution. Two are doctors and one a teacher. Ante la revolución nosotros vivíamos aquí 
eh, prácticamente gente aislada, con, gente aislada de la sociedad, gente que no, no teníamos nada, campesinos analfabetos, sin ningún tipo de cultura, no teníamos un radio, no teníamos absolutamente nada en que distraer, exclusivamente trabajar como animales. Cuba has made great strides in social services. Dr. Jose Ruiz is Providencia's community doctor. He and his nurse keep a close watch on their patients, no matter how inaccessible they are. In Cuba, there's a doctor for every 480 people. Healthcare, like education, is free to all. This afternoon's patient is five months pregnant. She'll be under constant supervision until she gives birth. Infant mortality here is as good as anywhere in the world, and average life expectancy in Cuba is now 74. Después del triunfo de la revolución, como usted puede darse cuenta, Cuba prácticamente es una potencia médica mundial. Se ha llevado la salud pública a los lugares más intrincados de la Sierra Maestra. The revolution looks after you from cradle to grave. In return, it demands complete conformity. Ideology and vigilance. Gervasio and his wife supervise both. There are those who say that with the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, that communism as an ideology is on the retreat. Do you think that's true in the case of Cuba? I think that after the disaster that has been in the countries of the East, our country, en nuestra patria. El compañero Fidel lo planteó bien claro y lo planteó hace dos días en Santiago de Cuba. Que la ideología de Cuba es una ideología socialista, marxista, leninista y que aquí en este país eh, será el país que será ejemplo de la construcción del socialismo. History has conspired to isolate Cuba. In Europe, Cuba is losing its main ideological allies. Moscow, the island's chief supporter, is making major structural adjustments to communism, while Castro's comrades in the Eastern Bloc have jettisoned it completely. In Latin America, the 1980s have seen the rejection of totalitarianism of both left and right. From Argentina's Galtieri to Chile's Pinochet, one by one, the dictators have fallen to democracy. In Central America, Castro has lost his best friends. Panama's Noriega, Cuba's ally of convenience, was ejected by U.S. troops. And Nicaragua's left-wing Sandinistas fell at their first free elections. Now the last one-party state in the region, Cuba alone has survived, despite the relentless hostility of its giant neighbor, the United States. In Havana docks, signs of 30 years of Soviet friendship. Over 70% of Cuba's imports, including most manufactured goods, come from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, most supplied on the cheap. The Cuban Revolution has never paid its way. Annually, it's received more than $5 billion in aid from Russia, but not anymore. From this year, Cuba has to pay for all imports at world market prices. Moscow's subsidies have ended. Trade with a new friend, China, is increasing, but nowhere near enough to rescue the Cuban economy. As Russian ships leave Havana, fewer are returning. We thought the Soviet assistance during the early days of the revolution, it would have been impossible for the revolution to survive. It was an essential factor for the survival of the revolution. And uh, the Soviet-Cuban economic relation is still very crucial for Cuba. I think that if those relations were totally eliminated at this stage, it will be totally destabilizing for the Cuban uh, economy and for the Cuban society. Like a postmodern cathedral, the Soviet embassy dominates Havana's diplomatic quarter. Its urbane ambassador, Yuri Petrov, wields more influence than anyone else in Cuba after Fidel himself. Petrov admits that economic troubles back home mean that for Cuba, the gravy train is over. С точки зрения расчетов, да, новая система, свободные мировые, вернее, мировые цены, расчеты свободно в конвертируемой валюте. 
Главная трудность будет заключаться в том, чтобы мы выполнили взятые на себя обязательства. Вот здесь я вижу наибольшую трудность в связи с теми конкретными процессами, которые сейчас происходят в нашей стране. Castro is embittered by what he sees as a betrayal by his former communist partners. He's well aware of the awful reality of the collapse of the communist trading community Comicon, as he told an impromptu press conference. Estos países se han vuelto hacia Occidente fundamentalmente, esperando grandes créditos, grandes ayudas de Estados Unidos y de otros países. Se han olvidado del tercer mundo y se han olvidado que existen países como Cuba bloqueados por el imperio. Sugar, this is Cuba's lifeblood. The island is the biggest exporter in the world. Most goes to the Soviets, who in return have provided Cuba with a quarter of a million barrels of oil a day at heavily subsidized prices. Despite this help, Cuba's sugar-based economy has shrunk for the last five years running. Foreign currency reserves have slumped to an all-time low. Now economists are keeping a death watch. This man speaks with some authority on the Cuban economy. He was Castro's main trade negotiator with the Soviets. But nine months ago, he gave it all up and defected from Comic-Con's Moscow headquarters. Now he lives in Miami, making a living by selling jeans. His prognosis for Cuba is extremely bleak. Unless a miracle happens, and I don't believe in miracles, the situation is very bad and even could get worse than before. In my personal opinion, in the one and a half or two years more, the economic situation will be almost in the frontier of a collapse. But Castro thinks he can work just such a miracle. The Golden Goose is foreign tourism, the quickest way to earn a hard buck. While foreigners are fated, Cuban belts are tightened. Magazines like Playboy are anathema to the Cuban Revolution, but this recent issue features, for the first time, the nubile beauties of Cuba Libre, with full cooperation from the authorities in Havana. It seems few holds are barred in the increasingly desperate drive to attract foreign tourists. Although it's the Caribbean's biggest island, Cuba attracts only 4% of the region's tourists. That's about to change. New hotels are rising like mushrooms after rain. Here, the dollar is king. But dollar worship has created a sort of tourist apartheid in egalitarian Cuba. In special dollar shops, foreign tourists can buy things most Cubans only dream about. It transforms locals into second-class citizens. But tourism could well be the Trojan horse which subverts Castro's hold. It's already breeding an increase in the black market. We don't have any alternative to tourism right now. We, ha we have to develop it uh, because we have economic difficulties that compel us to do it. Uh, we have to develop it in a very large uh, uh, way, making enormous investment in this field, and this will have, and is having already, negative impact in the Cuban society. As queues lengthen, life grows tougher for ordinary Cubans. They spend hours every day queuing for necessities. Prices are kept low, but almost everything is now rationed, and quotas are decreasing unrationed items almost unheard of. Shelves are often empty even of the goods supposedly available. A family of three, in theory, is now allowed only a single chicken and two cans of beef a month. But as the economic crisis bites, many shops remain virtually empty. Cubans do all have roofs over their heads, but only just. These Havana residents no longer have running water. 
The city is literally crumbling. This lady, keen to show us around, took us up the rickety stairs to introduce us to a neighbor who'd been hurt falling down them. A small room is home to three generations of a family, 11 people in all. Their plight is not unusual. Overcrowding is Cuba's nightmare. Food for all of them is prepared in a tiny kitchen. Privacy, an unknown luxury. Since the revolution, much of Havana has gone to seed. Now things are about to get dramatically worse. Not even the elite is exempt. Warming up for their dance performance, this is the National Folkloria Troupe, treading the boards at their Havana headquarters. But later today, they'll shed their leotards for the more robust business of potato picking. This is the second thrust of Castro's economic strategy. It's called the Special Period in Peacetime, a drastic survival course for socialism. It's one of the most astonishing austerity programs ever attempted. Under the program, millions of urban Cubans are being sent to the fields to boost food production. The dancers say they're volunteers, but refusing to volunteer could be extremely detrimental to their careers. Millions of city dwellers are billeted in rural hostels to prove their dedication to the revolution. But it doesn't make good economic sense, and it can at most be a temporary measure. Unless food production is boosted, however, there simply won't be enough to go around. In order to save the revolution, Castro is prepared to take his country backwards. This is one of the new oxen training stations that have sprung up across the country. The aim is to domesticate at least 400,000 bulls to take the place of tractors in the fields, as the tractors run short of fuel and spare parts. It's all part of the return to pre-industrial farming methods. Very drastic treatment indeed for the island's economic woes. On the roads, too, more cutbacks. Buses already crowded to bursting are stopping less frequently. Transport in Havana is a daily penance for the city's commuters. Once again, under the special period, the solution is low-tech and low-energy. This is the first batch of 700,000 bicycles imported from China. Put together by Cuban high school students, these bikes are becoming an increasingly familiar sight. Millions more are on order. The bikes are being handed out at subsidized prices, first to young people, but then to almost everyone. Today's novelty will be tomorrow's necessity. Cuba's leaders continue to put a brave face on the crisis. Vilma Espin is married to Fidel's brother, Raul. She grew up with the revolution. Now she's among the top five of the Cuban leadership. Espin may look like a middle American matron, but her heroes are Ho Chi Minh and Lenin. O sea que las soluciones que se van dando a las situaciones reales del momento actual son realmente eh, muy revolucionarias y que crean una gran unidad en el pueblo. Todo el mundo tiene una gran seguridad de que nosotros somos los que tenemos que resolver nuestros problemas. Que no podemos seguir esperando ayuda ni apoyo de todos de estos países que tienen problemas ellos mismos. But Cubans may not be as united as their leaders believe. It's very difficult for Cubans to talk frankly about their country. 
if they criticize the system openly, they risk being branded as counter-revolutionaries, and the consequences for them last long after we've gone. But some Cubans are still prepared to speak out, even in this most intensively policed society, where you're seldom alone. We had to protect the identity of those ordinary Cubans who do dare to criticize the revolution. You could not imagine how discouraged and desperate we are. We want to change, but we can't talk. We can't do anything, because you are watched and controlled. We can't stand the tyrant. We want him to die. Nobody likes him. He's a dictator, like he's saying. We are trapped. We are trapped, and we can't talk. Even in your block, you cannot say you don't agree with the government. This is the reason why most Cubans keep their mouths shut. The Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, the CDRs. They look innocuous enough, but they're the eyes and ears of the police state. Every house on every street, in every town or village, is part of the network of CDRs. From domestic squabbles and litter collection, to monitoring black marketeering and strangers, everything's their business. They're a sort of cross between a neighborhood watch and the Gestapo. Cualquier tipo de movimiento extraño que se detecte, que se vea en la cuadra, que no sea normal, el CDR debe estar a la expectativa en eso. Just another Sunday at Havana's most popular beach. Every weekend, thousands of teenagers make their way here to bask in the sun and have a good time. But look closely. Even here, you're under state scrutiny. A security policeman keeps a wary eye on the scene below. He's particularly interested in locals mixing with foreigners. Spotting us, he radios his plainclothes colleague on the beach, who warns us that we're not permitted to talk to Cubans without a license. It's all part of one of the tightest monitoring systems in the world. A growing number of young Cubans are fed up and have fled to Miami. Last year, Lester Marino windsurfed for 18 hours to reach Florida. Every year, hundreds try to escape on rafts, tires, anything they can scavenge. Many die in the attempt. He likes to be called the maximum leader. An adoring welcome from little Fidelistas. This is the Castro cult, and it's reached truly epic proportions. The bearded one is larger than life, and despite current problems, he's still a national hero to millions of his subjects, the closest thing to a communist monarch. Hasta un futuro bastante lejano, porque sus ideas, las ideas de Fidel son ideas inmortales, sirven para, para las nuevas generaciones. Fidel samples ice cream for the cameras. His every move is shadowed by a sycophantic media, and his enormously long speeches are reproduced in mind numbing fullness. He runs the country like a personal estate, regaling his captive audience with advice from world peace to the perfect hamburger. Pensar que soy lo más grande que hay en el mundo entero, mi vida, en el mundo. No hay otro como él, hija. Llamo mucho, porque nuestro líder se llama Fidel. Y con Fidel nos vamos a morir al precio que sea necesario. Muchas gracias. Eso era lo que yo quería. Que ustedes se quieran. The undiluted adoration means that Fidel is unaccustomed to even the hint of criticism. 
as we discovered when we tried to tackle them on the pressing question of the new generation's commitment to a revolution they never knew. From the most tender of ages, Cuba's children are force-fed Fidel. These five-year-olds are cutting their teeth on a poem in his praise. But is it only Fidel that holds the revolution together? It's very difficult for a man that uh, has been so long in power, that has gone through so many things, that has been so successful in his life, not to believe that he's God. Definitely, there is a tremendous respect. He has a tremendous authority. I don't think that there is any alternative to him today in Cuba. I think that he's very important for the Cuban revolution. But nevertheless, I don't think that he is the Cuban Revolution. Do you think the Cuban Revolution can survive the departure of Fidel Castro? Depends when he departs. <laughs> but I think, I hope that we will survive his departure. The problem is that sometimes uh, uh, when we have uh, a, such of a strong personality, uh, it's so light that everybody else is in darkness. So you will not have any other uh, light until that light goes off. Raul Castro, Fidel's younger brother, is his assumed heir, but he burns very dimly in Fidel's light. Projected on Cuban TV at Fidel's elbow, Raul lacks his brother's charisma. But as Minister of Defense, he's a key player in any succession. Fidel has retained the post of Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. The army is one of the main pillars of his power. But recently, there have been some rumblings within its ranks. A senior general was executed for drug trafficking, although many Cubans believe he was plotting against Fidel. Cuba's army is the second largest in Latin America and has seen action all over the world, wherever there were socialist revolutions to support. But revolution is out of fashion now, and the Cubans are coming home. Cuba's history has been dominated by the struggle for independence. Looking distinctly unrevolutionary, these Cuban soldiers belong to a unit that dates back to Cuba's 11 months of British rule in 1762. They still perform this nightly ritual. The Spanish legacy is more substantial. Discovered by Christopher Columbus, Cuba was under Spanish rule for four centuries. Havana became Spain's most important outpost in the New World. It was only after three independence wars that the Cubans finally shook off Madrid's rule in 1902. But Republican Cuba then fell under American domination, becoming a playground for wealthy foreigners. Favored holiday home for the mafia, gambling, prostitution, and revelry were rife. Under President Batista, Cuba was reduced to little more than a private bordello, moored for the convenience of the Americans, 90 miles off the Florida Keys. Hace solo 30 años vivíamos en el capitalismo. O sea que nosotros sabemos que no hay otra opción para los países como los nuestros. En los capitalistas, los pobres viven como vivían, como se viven los países subdesarrollados actualmente que no tienen un sistema socialista. Ahora, quizás algún día surja un sistema más ideal, mejor todavía, que el que llamamos socialismo. En el momento actual no hay ninguno mejor que este. 
American hostility to Castro goes back to his embracing the Soviets in the early days of the revolution. This gave the Soviets a foothold in Washington's backyard. Relations were further poisoned when anti-Castro forces from the US landed on Cuba in the abortive Bay of Pigs invasion. Then came the missile crisis. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. When Moscow tried to deploy nuclear missiles on Cuba, the world was brought to the brink of a nuclear war in an apocalyptic game of chicken. Despite Castro's urgings, Moscow blinked first. U.S. hostility to Cuba continued. The U.S. trade embargo remained in place, and Castro stayed at the top of Washington's hate list. A bizarre geographical quirk, this is Guantanamo Bay, 43 square miles of American-held territory on the southern tip of Cuba. The Cubans keep a close watch on the American base, fearful it could be used as a beachhead for another Bay of Pigs. Castro calls Guantanamo a knife in the heart of Cuba. FM 103.1, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The naval base, complete with a small American town, is occupied under a pre-revolutionary lease. Every year, Washington sends a rent check of $4,000, and every year, Castro tears it up personally. America's hostility is Castro's best asset. When things get bad, he drums up the anti-Americanism. Cuba's revolution has been about the forging of a nation from a colony. Today's Cuba has carved for itself a unique culture. This ritual is Santeria, a remnant of the old slave religions of Africa. It used to be dismissed as a variation of voodoo, but today it probably has a deeper hold than either Christianity or Marxism. As economic conditions deteriorate, Cubans turn for solace to the spiritual. Religions like Catholicism, associated with all the privileges and elitism of the old colonial times, were treated more harshly. Castro abolished Christmas and declared Cuba atheist. But as he casts around for support, he's easing up on his spiritual rivals. The island's blacks and mulattoes, about half the population, have benefited most from the revolution. Manuel Mendive is one of the Ministry of Culture's favoured sons. His work draws much from the West African creation mythology. Today's performance at the Karl Marx Theatre is before an audience of government VIPs and diplomats. Cuba is one of the world's most racially integrated societies. Miami, USA, and safe in his bulletproof Mercedes, Jorge Mas exiled Cuban, millionaire businessman, seen by many as the main alternative to Fidel Castro. As president of the Cuban-American National Foundation, he claims to have one hand in Wall Street's wallet and the other on Washington's pulse. 
His organization is by far the most effective Cuban pressure group. They've already drawn up a new constitution and a new economic plan for a post-Castro Cuba. We are including in this package of reforms the privatization of every single asset that the Cuban government owns today. We believe that Cuba can enjoy maybe in the first couple of years around 15 to, from 15 to 21 billion dollars in economic assistance from the private sector of the West, not including any nation of any government, because we don't want to change masters. Like so many Cubans in America, Mass and his wife have prospered under capitalism, and they believe Cuba could do the same. If you ask me today what is my biggest dream, I would say to provide my fellow citizens in Cuba with the same opportunities that the American system provided me with. Present! Huh. Faster. At their training camp in the Florida Everglades, new recruits on parade for Alpha 66, a private guerrilla army dedicated to Castro's overthrow. Present! Huh. After 32 years, recruitment is on the rise again, as more heed the cry of Cuban nationalism and the call to arms. These weekend warriors were originally trained by the CIA. Many took part in the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now they claim to have 11 sabotage teams operating in Cuba. For all their fierce war games, however, it's unlikely that this lot will unseat Fidel. Están ustedes en sintonía con la voz de Alfa 66, hablando de militar a militar, de soldado a soldado. Con, con Alpha 66 el rents weekly airtime from a middle American evangelical station to broadcast to Cuba. But the message is not one of forgiveness. Fidel Castro es un tirano que te arrastrará a ti. Por eso utiliza tu fuerza y tu posición dentro de las Fuerzas Armadas para la liberación de la patria cubana. During the revolution, Nazario fought at Fidel's side as one of his trusted lieutenants, but he became disillusioned. Yo luché por un gobierno democrático que se respetara los derechos humanos y que se respetara la libre expresión del pensamiento. Castro nunca aceptó que las personas pudieran tomar determinación por su propio. Entonces me comprendí que había que salir y por eso salí de Cuba para tratar de nuevo de derrotar la tiranía. From an office in Miami, Oscar Alvarez helps to keep in touch with Cuba's embattled dissidents. There are only a handful of telephone lines between the two countries, and the lines are almost constantly engaged. Oscar was a prominent Cuban actor and a dissident himself until he was let out last year. Now he provides a link with American human rights groups. One way or the other, if uh, you're not in jail, you are... Uh, an accomplice of what's going on. And what's going on is not nice. There is a lot of repression. There are thousands of people in jail for one or another reason. And uh, also it's a uh, society living in perpetual hypocrisy where nobody dares to say what really thinks. Those who do say what they think suffer the consequences. In Havana, this is Oscar's old neighbor, Gerardo Sanchez, who's acting president of the Human Rights Commission of Cuba. He took over the post from his brother, who was jailed for rebellion. Se organizan muy, muy informalmente, pero hay muestras de esa, de esa efervescencia, de ese descontento. 
But just how much discontent and agitation is there? It's here at the University of Havana that the seeds of dissent are most likely to find fertile soil. This is Fidel's old stamping ground, where once he fired up his fellow students. But there's little political fire here today. Gustavo Arcos is Cuba's answer to Alexander Solzhenitsyn. In and out of prison, he's protected by his high international profile. He believes Castro's rule is in its twilight. Mi certeza, por no decir mi ver, la verdad eh, que tenemos nosotros de que este régimen, como se, se dice, ya ha decaído, ya está derrotado. Solo se mantiene por el mecanismo de poder, por el estado de terror. Fíjense que una prueba es de que se niega de todas maneras a celebrar alguna forma, por ejemplo, de referendo, de pulsar la opinión nacional, porque saben que serían derrotados completamente. Entonces tratan de sobrevivir y de inventar una serie de planes fantásticos ahora, el llamado periodo especial, el plan alimentario, todo eso irá al fracaso o no resolverá los problemas fundamentales. Yo pienso que está abocado a una crisis y que esa crisis obligará a reconsiderar a sectores del gobierno que no puede seguir en esa situación y que habrá entonces, digamos, un cambio. Still under construction, the venue for Cuba's fourth party congress in Santiago de Cuba. Constantly postponed, no one can tell us when the congress will happen, but it won't be till this is finished. The Communist Party is confronted with an unprecedented crisis, but debate is closely defined by Fidel. No one may question the leadership, the ideology, or the main economic policies. Other than that, they're free to discuss anything at all. It's here that Fidel Castro will take the stage at the Fourth Party Congress. The New World Order is proving a far unfriendlier place for Cuba. In many respects, the revolution is facing its worst crisis ever. But few expect Castro to announce any real reforms. If there's one lesson he's learnt from the experiences of Eastern Europe, it's that even small reforms lead to big ones. The Cuban Revolution, says Castro, is like a bicycle. It may have brakes, but no reverse gear. And so long as he's the rider, the chances of an ideological U-turn are about negligible. Marxism, Leninism or death is still today's message. For Cubans, the writing's on the wall. The way forward is backwards to the revolution. I feel devastated when I think of the future of my country. I think we are really wounded that the moral fiber of our nation has been damaged uh, so badly by, by Castro that uh, recovery is going to be very, very painful and very, very long. Meanwhile, the exiles of Alpha 66 continue their weekend patrols off the coast of Cuba. Their mission, to cast bottles onto the waves, to be washed up on Cuban shores. Inside, there's a message for their Cuban brethren. Rise up against the dictator, Fidel Castro, it reads. You have only your chains to lose. They've been sending the same message for 32 years. But this year, they think, we'll finally see it heeded.